people how to walk in my holiness, in my presence, in my power. Remember the three traits of the end times people will be that they will walk God's end times people in holiness, purity, and the fear of the Lord. And if we will be willing to walk in holiness, santo, purity, and the fear of the Lord, we are going to see a mighty revival come. If we're not willing to, then we'll see a mighty revival come all around us. But the Lord says to this house, I desire to be the fire about you and the glory within you. Does anybody want that in the Lord? Amen. I'll be the fire about you and I'll be the glory within you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How many receive that in the Lord this morning? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So how many are ready on this day of Pentecost to receive a word from the Lord? Amen. Amen. So God's already speaking. Amen. And by the way, look around the house today. Are we not blessed? Amen. 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 With a bunch of amazing, radical, laid down Jesus lovers in this place today. Are we not blessed? Yeah. I decree and declare today that the Lord has done some pruning and now the new growth is coming into this house. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. The truth is, guys, he's always pruning. Yeah, yeah. is the truth but the pruning always brings new growth and I declare in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth the season of attack against this house is over in Jesus name I declare the assault is over in Jesus name that no weapon formed against us will prosper and will refute every tongue that comes against us for this is our heritage as servants of the living God and vindication from me declares the Lord God almighty Amen. Holy Spirit just spoke to me and the Holy Spirit said, tell my people to ask me to teach them how to walk continuously in my presence. Because I'm raising up a people that don't go in and out of my presence. He said, I'm raising up a people who will learn how to find a place of habitation in my presence. I do not desire visitation, I desire habitation. And I am raising up a people who will be a people of habitation. The Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry said, The birds of the air have nests, and the foxes of the field have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I didn't see that as a declaration of homelessness. I believe that was an invitation that Jesus was speaking to the end times church. He's saying, uh, will you be a church where I can lay my head? I don't think you heard the Lord. Will we be a church where he can lay his head? Amen. How many receive that in the Lord? Will you have a walk with Jesus where he can lay his head? God is wanting to bring you into a place of habitation. Do you receive that? Amen. Okay, let me ask you again. Do you receive that? Yes. Okay. Let me tell you what I'm sensing in the Lord. I'm sensing in the Lord that we are coming into a new season in Him. I believe that God is bringing His church into a new season. How many receive that in the Lord? I believe that, and there's a shifting that's taking place. The Lord says, my people will do one of two things. You will either be a part of the shift, or you will watch the shift happen. How many know that we want to be a part of the shift? Amen. So the Lord is saying right now, I'm looking for a people that's willing to be shifted. Meaning we're willing to let God deal with us, change us, purge us, refine us, position us to move into what he's about to do. Yeah. If we aren't willing to let God do that, we're going to risk missing what he's about to do. And I say as a church that we do not want to miss the move of God that is upon us. There's a moving of unity that God is bringing amongst his churches in this region. There's an anointing of healing that's coming upon his people. Of restoration. Yeah. Of breaking shackles and fetters. Of moving forward in him yeah. and not looking back. God says I'm going to break complacency off of my people. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. I'm going to break apathy off of my people. Amen. How many receive that? Amen. See, we've got to understand this in the Lord. One of my favorite pastors who's now with the Lord named, named James Ryle had an encounter with an angel one day. How many want to have angelic encounters? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And in this angelic encounter, he was sleeping in bed, and all of a sudden he felt something staring at him. Anybody ever been in bed before and you feel something staring at you? All right. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, we give you this word right now. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you'll take the word of Jesus in this house, that you'll break it like bread. And Holy Spirit, may you release a mighty anointing to feed upon the word of God today, a manifest. And we ask this through the powerful blood of Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. We just give you this time, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. So James Ryle's in bed and, and, and he feels something staring at, at him and he looks up and there's an angel right in his face staring at him. Whoa. Wouldn't that be exciting? So the angel steps back. He gets out of bed. He looks at the angel and the angel's just staring at him, smiling. And finally he breaks the silence. He looks at the angel and he says, What? What do you want? What? And the angel looks at him and said, I just came from the throne of the Father and I have a message for you from the Father. He said, actually, it's not a message as much as it's a question. And this is what the Father told me to ask of you. And he said, the angel moved closer to him, put his hands on his hips and pressed forward and the angel got in his face and said to him, the father wants to know, are you going to go the distance? And he said, immediately he thought to himself, wait a minute, God doesn't already know the answer to that question. And then he thought of an old Baptist preacher up in the hills of Tennessee who used to preach and he used to always say when he preached on the radio, God doesn't ask a question because he needs to know the answer. He asks a question so that you can hear the answer that you give. And so after the angel got in his face and said, the father's asking, will you go the distance? The angel stepped away and he said he put his hands on his hips and looked at the angel and got in his face and he said, you tell the father, I said, yes! yes! And all of a sudden, something like a backpack fell off of him. And he looked back at it, and he looked at the angel. And the angel said, do you want to know what that is? And the angel said, yes. And he, and he said, yes to the angel. And the angel said, that's the spirit of apathy. It keeps my people from going the distance. And I'm removing an apathetic spirit off of my people. Amen. What's an apathetic spirit? Well, you know, if this happens, it happens. If I go, I go. If I don't, I don't. Whatever. That's an apathetic spirit. And God says, I'm taking my people from the defensive to the offensive. I'm calling my army into an alignment. And there's about to be a mighty forward movement, says the Lord. Yeah. And the Lord says, you're to be a part of that. And apathy has no place in that equation. So God says, I want to set my people free from the spirit of apathy. I say this day, we say to the Father, Yes! yes! Amen. Amen. Mm, how many receive that of the Lord? Woo, hallelujah. Are you ready to receive the word today? Amen. By the way, we're going to take communion. Amen. Hallelujah. Later this day. So uh, after the word today, we're going to take communion together. You don't have to be a part of this house to take communion, just part of the family of God. Amen? Amen. So we want to encourage everybody to stay and, and to take communion with us here after the word. And then there's a couple prophetic words that God's going to release beyond the prophetic that he's already released in this place today and will in this word. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 60 today. We're going to pick up today talking about the light of God. Last week, we talked about the fact that the Lord Jesus in the book of Matthew said that his people are two things. He said, my people are light and they're salt. How many received that in the word? 
Okay, the, the Lord says, my people are light and they're salt. And God says, I'm wanting my people, hallelujah, at the end of the age to be light in the midst of the darkness and savor in the midst of a tasteless age. How many received that in the Lord this morning? Amen. When you have Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1, please stand up. Please stand up. We're going to stand to honor God in the first reading of His Word. How many know that the Lord Jesus is the Word made flesh? Amen. Hallelujah. So, the Word says in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1, and this is not a request of the Lord, this is a command of the Lord. How many know in the Word of God there are requests, there are commands, and God says things to catch our attention? This is not something to get our attention. This is not a request. This is a command from our king at the end of the age. Do you receive this? Amen. It's a mandate. What's the mandate? Arise! Amen. And the Lord says, not only arise, but shine, for your light has come. For the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth. How many know that darkness is coming upon the earth? Yeah. And the earth is about to see a thick supernatural darkness like the earth has never seen before. The Lord says, see, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the people, is over the people. It's a spirit of darkness over the people. Are we seeing this, guys? As in the days of Noah. But notice the word but. The word but is an eraser. It erases everything that came before it. What was the Lord talking about? Thick darkness. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your what? Light. To your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. How many received the Lord Jesus this morning in everything that he's saying and everything that he's doing? The Lord is saying this morning that I want my people to be light in the midst of the darkness. How many received that? But what we need to understand is God's not talking about a flashlight, a pin light, walking in the room and turning on the light. God is saying, I want my people to walk in a supernatural illumination of my glory light anointing. I hope you receive this in the Lord. The Lord is saying, I'm calling my people to press into the secret place. Press into me in the secret place. And through intimacy, the Spirit of God is going to release the glory light of God over the people of God. And the people of God are going to walk out of the secret place with the glory light of God manifesting from them. This is a supernatural glory light of God. How many receive that? Amen. So we've got to understand some things about God this morning. How many know the Word says that God is light? In fact, the Word says He dwells in unappro mm, unapproachable light. The book of Revelation says if we can see the throne of God, there's an emerald rainbow radiating from the throne of God at all times. And angels are bowing and saints are worshiping. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I believe the worship service in the throne room of God is like a river. And it just flows continuously. I believe that God's about to teach churches that are willing how to replicate the atmosphere of the throne room of God in their midst. See, we've got to understand man's segments. God doesn't segment. In man's church... We've got three songs and an offering. We've got two songs. And then there's word and then there's prayer. And then we're out. It's almost 12 o'clock. We better go home now. That's, man, God, that's man's segmentation. Do you know what happened at the Azusa Street Revival over 100 years ago? In Azusa Street, Pastor Seymour would sit up on the altar with a box on his head because he didn't want to get in the way of what the Holy Spirit was doing. And the Holy Spirit would just move like a river in the room. And the Holy Spirit would move over here and healings would take place. And over here, and people would get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Move over here and deliverance would, would start moving. And the Holy Spirit would just move all around the room doing different things. 
Same thing happened in Catherine Coleman's services in the 1960s. She would just get out of the way and let Holy Spirit move. Holy Spirit would move and start touching people and tell her. And she'd say, someone in the third row just got healed of cancer. Somebody up in the balcony just got delivered from this. God just did this over here. She got out of the way so that the Holy Spirit could move. Amen. Church, I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit wants to teach the church at the end of the age how to get out of the way so that he can move. And he wants to set us free from segmentation. Guys, there's going to be services where we walk in the door and Holy Spirit just starts taking people out of the realm of the Spirit and starts giving them visions and showing them great and mighty things that they don't know. We're about to see God move in a way that we've never seen God move before. Therefore, we need to let the Holy Spirit set us free from what we've known the church to be. Come on now. We've been taught a system. Made by man, we have not been taught how the throne room of God operates. Why is this important? Let me tell you why it's important. God gave Moses a glimpse of the heavenly tabernacle. And then God said to Moses, build it exactly the way that I showed you. And if you will build it the way that I showed you, my glory light will come. Moses built it exactly the way that God showed him. And the glory came down and exploded upon the tabernacle when they dedicated it to the Lord. In fact, when, when God wanted to speak to Moses, the glory cloud would just hover over the tabernacle. Is anybody hearing what the Lord is saying? See, God showed Moses the way something looked in heaven and anointed him in an apostolic anointing to be able to reproduce it here on earth. See, God is raising up true end times apostles and God is going to show them things the way that they work in heaven, the third heaven, and they're going to replicate those things here on earth and the glory is going to come. Are we getting this? So God is about to give people visions and encounters within the throne room of God to experience the river, and then God is going to use them to release that here on earth. And when services become like the river of the praise and worship that's going on, like the service that's going on right now in the throne room of God, People are going to walk into an atmosphere charged with the glory, with miracles, with signs, with wonders. People will walk right in the door and fall on their face and get saved because they're going to walk into the atmosphere of heaven. Yes. Yes. See, I want you to understand what's coming. But this is not going to come as God's people sit in complacency. This is going to come as God's people press in to Jesus, hunger for a mighty move of God, and go after God with all of their hearts. Are you willing to allow God to move you out of a place of complacency? Because we've all got our own version of complacency. How many are hearing what the Spirit of God is saying? All right. So today we're talking about the fact that God's called us to be light. Has anybody ever studied a guy by the name of Charles Finney? Yeah. Somebody came into the church one day and prophesied. They looked at me and they said, you're going to walk like Charles Finney walked. And I thought, Charles Finney, well, that, that's kind of interesting. I've heard the name, but I don't know much about him. You know, we talk about Smith Wigglesworth and Catherine Coleman and William H. Branham and all of these folks that God used in a mighty way within the last hundred years or so. But Charles Finney was an interesting guy. If you study him, he was interesting because he didn't preach. He was a preacher that didn't preach. God gave him an incredibly unique ministry. Do you want to know what his ministry was? His ministry was flowing in the glory, light, anointing of God. Whoa, wait a minute. See, we've been taught in the church, this is how you reach people. We've been taught the system. Let me tell you what, guys. How many know that when God's people are walking in the manifest glory light of God and they're walking past the unsaved, that the glory light of God is going to come upon them and touch them? There are things happening where we're not even going to say a word. God is just going to leap out of his people and fall upon, uh, mm, upon people all around them and we're going to see revival break out all around us. Does anybody receive this? So here's what God did in Charles Finney. 
God told him, this is your ministry. I'm going to fill you with my glory and I'm going to have you ride on trains. Did anybody just hear that? God said, I'm going to fill you with my glory and I'm going to have you ride on trains. You're not going to preach. You're not going to teach. You're not going to minister. You're going to ride on trains throughout America from town to town. Great, am I going to get off and, and, and preach from the train door? No, you're not even going to get off the train, God said to him. And you know what God did in Charles Finney? As he went from town to town, and in every town the train went through, the train stopped. The train would stop to let people off and let people on. What would happen is the glory light of God that came from his abiding relationship with Jesus would come forth from him and people all over these towns would begin to fall on their faces and repent and cry out to Jesus and revival would be released in those towns in the 10 to 15 minutes he just drove through on the train. Amen. I'm telling you what, guys, God is about to raise up ministries at the end of the age that are very unconventional. He's about to raise up ministries at the end of the age through very unconventional people. He's about to do things as strange at the end of the age as a man walking a hippo on a leash in a garden. See, we've got to understand, God is about to redefine everything that we know is Christianity. Amen. I don't know how many people heard me on this one. God's about to redefine everything. Yeah. God is speaking. He's saying, behold, I'm doing a new thing. George was texting that to me at like 4.15 this after this morning. What were you doing up at 4.15 this morning, George? He's texting me this at 4.15 in the morning. I look at my phone. God's doing a new thing. Yeah. And he was speaking it yesterday. Yep. The Hispanic pastor gets up yesterday in the park on 11th Street. And the first thing he says after he says, Santo, 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 Holy, Holy, Holy. He said, God's doing a new thing. Yeah. Oh, do you not see it? Do you not perceive it? Can I hear an amen? Amen. So Finney would just ride on the train. He wouldn't get off. Train would open up. Folks would get off, get on. The glory light of God would radiate from him and revival would break loose in that town. And then the train would just choo choo, just keep on going. That was his ministry. Let me ask you a question. Are you allowing, are you willing to allow God to birth a ministry through you that's incredibly unconventional? Are you willing to let God birth a ministry through you where they may never know your name? But wherever you go, the glory of God, a deposit of the glory of God is left. Amen. Are you willing to be nameless and faceless for the sake of Jesus? Are you willing to walk in such intimacy with him that you don't care if anybody ever knows who you are? All you want to see is Jesus released in a lost and dying world. Amen. Is anybody willing? Amen. I'm telling you guys, the five wise virgins were oily. We talked about they had oil in their lamps. I think they were covered with oil. And everywhere they went, I believe the, a deposit of the oil was left. You ever seen a car that's leaking oil pretty bad? You can tell where that car's been. Drip, 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 drip. I believe God's about to pour out such a glory light and anointing on his people that everywhere they go, drip, 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 drip. Is anybody hearing this? Guys, I totally believe this is the Lord. I totally believe this is the Lord. But that's only going to happen as we surrender to Him. How many received this in the Lord? Amen. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. How many are enjoying this word already? Amen. Amen. How many are willing to let God change them through this word? Amen. Okay. The angels in the room just recorded that, yes. Amen. So God's going to begin to move in and a mighty change in your life. When God begins to rearrange the furniture, but not necessarily in ways that you appreciate, God wants you to remember that in this very service today, you said, yes, Lord. Amen. I want this. And I'm telling you what, guys, and we got to understand this. If you can get a hold of this, this is going to change your life and it's going to help you navigate the season that we're in. God's about to rearrange the furniture in your life, but he's not necessarily going to do it in a way that you may like. But if you will just surrender to what God's doing, you're going to be amazed at what's about to happen in your life. 
Okay, I got half an amen, and I think it was from my wife. Okay, so let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. The word says this, Be very careful then how you live. Woo! What's the Lord saying to the church right now? Josiah, the Lord is saying, be very careful how you live. Mark, he's saying, be very careful how you live. Come on. Melissa, he's saying, be very careful how you live. God says, I want you to get a prophetic understanding that you're living at the end of the age. Your life is not your own. You're bought with a price. Live like I am coming back soon and you are part of my impossible mission force. Yes. My holy IMF. How many receive that in the Lord? Amen. So the Lord says, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Amen. Now the word unwise there Interestingly enough, in the Koine, a Greek would translate morally foolish. So what does that mean? Chasing after the pleasures of this age. So the Lord is really saying here, be very careful then how you live, not pursuing the pleasures of this age that will never satisfy, but rather being wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are what, church? Because the days are evil. I've got a word from the Lord for you right now, and I want you to grab a hold of this in the Lord. The Lord is saying this. The days are evil, but I'm redeeming the time. The days are evil, but I'm redeeming the time. The Lord is redeeming the time not only in your life. God's not only redeeming the time in this church. God says, I'm redeeming the time in a generation. I'm redeeming the time in a generation. How many receive that in the Lord? So let's read that again. The Lord says in Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. God says in the midst of the darkness, I am redeeming the time of my people. Now I want you to understand something. In order to understand what that word means, tell my people I'm redeeming the time. We've got to understand what the word redeem means. The word redeem, if we take it back into the Hebrew, means to buy back or to gain back possession of something. It means to buy back or gain back possession of something. So what is Jesus saying? I not only redeemed you through my blood... In the Baptist church, we used to love to sing this song, Redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We used to sing this hymn in the Baptist church. I don't think we truly understood what it meant to be redeemed. See, you were born in the darkness, but when you received Jesus as Savior, His blood purchased you. It redeemed you out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. What did Jesus do? He bought you back through His blood. The blood of all the lambs that were sacrificed in the Old Covenant, it was just symbolic. They had to keep bringing a lamb and 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 keep bringing a lamb. It kept the Levite priests busy because the blood of a lamb could never take away sin until the spotless lamb came whose blood could take away the sin of the world. And he says, I've not only redeemed you from the kingdom of darkness, I'm now purchasing back the time you've lost through my blood. So let me ask you a question. Anybody in this room, have you ever lost a season to rebellion? Have you ever lost a season to waywardness? Have you ever lost a season to doing your own thing? Have you ever lost a season because you got hurt in church and you didn't go back? Have you ever lost a season to illness? Have you ever lost a season to being going through demonic attack? Have you ever lost anything? God says I'm redeeming it back through my blood. But he says I'm also redeeming back the time. Now this one gets really interesting. We've got to understand that God is not bound by the timeline. Mm -hmm. The Lord says, I see the end from the beginning. The more I get to know the Lord, the more I realize He sees things completely opposite than the way that I do. Mm -hmm. 
And he says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts than your thoughts, says the Lord. So the Lord is saying, I want to bring you into my understanding. I want to teach you my ways. I want you to begin to think like I think. So how do we see life? Birth to death. That's how we see life. Beginning to end. But how do we know that our God is the God who was and is and is to come? He's not bound by time. He who makes the law is not bound by it. So God says, I see the end of the timeline all the way to the beginning. Which means what? We see everything beginning with God saying, let there be light. Jesus, before he said, let there be life, was standing at the wedding feast of the Lamb with the redeemed. And then he looked down the timeline and said, let there be light. What's God doing right now in your life? He's standing in this position and you're over here and he's looking behind you at the things that were lost and he's redeeming them through your blood and it's like his hand is going behind you, grabbing those things and he's bringing them into the now. And he's bringing them in to what's yet in front of you and you're about to step into it. He who created time legally can redeem time. He says, I'm restoring back to you what the locusts have eaten and what the enemy has stolen. He says, I'm giving it back legally. It is yours. So God is saying to a lot of people, stop grieving over the past. I'm reaching into the past. I'm redeeming. And I'm pulling things into your now and into your future that were stolen from you, forsaken, forgotten, even things that you did a forego on because you made the wrong decision. I'm redeeming the time. Now we need to understand this. He's redeeming the time in the midst of a season where time is accelerating. Time is going quicker. Which means he's redeeming faster. Which means a lot of things are about to happen. Boom, 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 boom. So we've got to be careful the way that we live so that we're ready at every moment to walk in what God has for us. Be careful how you walk. Isn't that what we just read? Amen? See, we've got to understand this. And what does the word say in Isaiah 60? That darkness is over the nation. Darkness is over the peoples. How many read that just a few moments ago? We've got to understand that that is spiritual darkness. There's a darkness that's coming on the earth like the earth has never seen before. God gave me a vision of this so 10, 15 years ago. We were in this very sanctuary. It was is in the middle of the day, but there was such a thick supernatural darkness. It looked like it was the darkest midnight outside that door. If you stood in the foyer and looked at it, we're worshiping and praising the fire of God's in the room, the power of God's in the room. It's incredible. And just on the other side of the wall is thick darkness. How many receive this? See, that's the contrast at the end of the age. Thick darkness on one side of the wall, incredible, unapproachable light on the other side. Well, Pastor, I don't know if I can quite grasp that. Israel saw it. Remember when Egypt was pursuing Israel, the army, as Israel came up to the Red Sea? And what did God do? God put a wall of fire. God put a wall of fire between them. How many know the atmosphere on either side of the wall was completely different? On one side was an atmosphere of the glory. On the other side was an atmosphere of darkness. Is anybody getting this? We're going to see contrasts like that. And we're all in here enjoying the Lord. And then out of the darkness, I could see supernaturally people darting out of the darkness, coming through the door as quick as they could. And they were being pursued. (coughs) But if they got in the door, they could come into the light. And they kept coming, they kept coming, they kept coming, they kept coming. We had a doorman there that would just sole purpose, like the watchman on the wall, the sole purpose, like the, the priests and the cities of refuge, would be to watch at the door and let people in as they were running from the avenger of blood. Oh, we got to get a vision for what's coming. If God's not turning your life upside down, he's going to. We've got to understand what's about to happen, right? So what is darkness? It's a life without the life and light of God. That's simply what it is. And what's God going to use his people to do? He's going to use his people to bring the light. How many received that? I've been studying light. And you know what I find? The more that I study what light is, the more 
amazing Jesus becomes to me. I believe we're coming into an age where scientific discoveries are going to do nothing but prove the validity of the Word of God. Come on. We've got to understand that in the Lord. What was the, one of the very first things Jesus said that we see in the Old Testament? Genesis chapter 1. Let there be light. light. Hallelujah. The Lord says that He is light. And if He is light, then we are light. Why are we light? Because we're created in His image. How many receive that in the Lord? Here's the interesting thing about light and darkness. Light can be measured, but darkness cannot. Light can be tangibly measured, but darkness cannot. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. And I believe in my heart, fully in my heart, that whenever God sees darkness, His answer is the light. Because He is light. Because darkness is the opposite of who our God is. If our God is light, then darkness is the opposite of Him. And what is darkness? It's a life without the life and light of God in it. And God right now is looking at this generation. And guys, I'm going to say this in love and know my heart as I say this. We were Jesus walking yesterday. We were with a group that walked five miles through downtown Rockford. There were speakers going, shofars blowing. Jesus! Jesus! Walking through downtown Rockford, and we walked right past the office, and right past, some of y'all may know what the office is. We walked right past the office, and there's an alleyway there. It was all full of pride booths, and we're walking by, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We were the light in the midst of the darkness. I don't think you heard that. We are the light in the midst of the darkness. But guys, I'm going to tell you this. Jesus wasn't looking down that alley full of booths and he wasn't going, you people. Oh. He was looking at that alley and he saw darkness. And I believe Jesus was crying out, I am the light! And the Lord desired to release his light down that alleyway. See, we've got to understand when God sees darkness, especially at the end of the age, He doesn't go, oh! He looks at it and He goes, I want to release my light through my people into that darkness because I desire that all men would be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. And I'm believing that God is going to give this church a mighty ministry to the LGBTQ community. Amen? Amen. 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 Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Did I hear an amen? Amen. See, we've got to understand this in the Lord. So if we go back to Genesis 1, I want you to see something. How many are enjoying this word? Genesis chapter 1. I want you to understand something. When we get into Genesis chapter 1, the word says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Wait a minute now. The earth was filled with what? Darkness. But in the midst of the darkness, what was the Holy Spirit doing? Hovering over the waters. What does that mean? Even in the midst of darkness, God is there. And we've got to realize when God sends us in some dark places, we've got to realize that God goes with us. He said to Joshua, don't be discouraged, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you. Wherever you go. So we've got to understand, here's thick darkness, but the Spirit of God is there. We've got to understand that. We can't think here's darkness so the Spirit of God is way over here. No, He came to seek and save that which was lost. And He wants to do it through you. And He wants to bring His glory light through you. There are some people that you can preach the gospel to all day long and they not respond because the prince of darkness has blinded them. But when the light manifests from you, they're going to know. See, the light will be able to speak things that our words won't be able to. See, we've got to understand in heaven, godly Christian folks that have had encounters with God and been in the third heaven, they all say the same thing. In heaven, nobody talks. There's just an understanding. 
And you communicate without words. Yeah. See, I believe some of the greatest gospel at the end of the age will be communicated without words. It will be communicated through the glory of God falling on places Amen. and through his people. Pastor, I need scripture and verse on that. Well, I'm glad you asked. Joel chapter 2, and I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Yeah. How many receive that? Yeah. It doesn't say we're all flesh is willing. He said, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Oh. We're about to see God's people show up in places, and then boom, the glory of God comes. Yeah. See, we've got to understand that the military has painting technology. They can paint a target and then release a missile that hits where the painting is done. Is anybody catching that? Okay. Just like we were walking through the city yesterday and they had the red and white X's on buildings that they were tearing, going to tear down. Right? That was a marking of those buildings. They were destined for something. They were going to be teared down. And so when they saw the when they see the red and white X, they know to tear that building down. The military can paint a target and then shoot a missile or release a bomb in the right in the exact area, pinpoint where it was painted. Shh. Why do you mention that, Pastor? Because God is going to send his people in to paint targets. And boom, the glory of God is going to fall in those areas. God's going to have us interceding for places around the world and painting them through intercession. And boom, he's going to release his glory. That's why you cannot discount what God wants to do through your life at the end of the age. Everybody's calling is significant. Everybody's ministry matters. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? So Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 and 2, what's going on? Darkness, formlessness, chaos. And what's God's answer? Verse 3. And God said, let there be light! And there was light! You know what God's going to do in the darkest areas of the earth at the end of the age? He's going to say, let there be light and send His people in. And the glory light of God is going to manifest through them. Is anybody at all hearing yeah. what God's saying? Do you, want, do you want to know how awesome our God is? Somebody just ask, how awesome is our God? How awesome is our God? Okay, this is what I want you to understand about God. I've got an amazingly anointed and scientific son sitting over here in the corner. And he could probably tell us right now what the speed of light is. So, so, so let's 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 see here, Zach. What's what's the speed of light? Okay. So he's talking in kilometers. That's okay, metric system. Let me pull it in miles on that, Zach. Can you tell us miles? Okay. All right. We'll give him the kilometers, right? We'll, we'll give him that. Okay. The speed of light is one hundred and eighty-six thousand miles per second. That's fast. It's 186,000 miles per second. Remember I said a moment ago, you can measure light, but you can't measure darkness. Light has a speed. It travels, and it travels quickly. It's made up of photons. Photons are packets of light, and light has a speed. It's very interesting when you study light, different types of light travel at different speeds, right? There is a wavelength. Well, it's interesting, light travels in waves. And we'll talk about that more in just a little bit. Light travels in waves. The shorter the wave, the quicker the light moves. Longer the wave, the more elongated the pathway of that light moves. But light in general moves at 186,000 miles per second. When God said, let there be light... That word came forth from his mouth and light appeared instantly. See, when you go out on a starry night and you look and see the stars, the light from that star had to travel untold miles to be able to get to your eye to be able to see it. It traveled for years at the speed of light in order for you to be able to see it that night. When Jesus speaks, he's not bound by the loss. Of thermodynamics. He's not law bound by the laws of earth. He's not bound by the laws of gravity. When he spoke it, light traveled way more quickly than normally it would. Jesus can speak a star into being, and the amount of time in the natural it would take for the light to get from that star for us to see it on earth, he bypasses that, and the light moves quicker than light speed. It moves at the speed of his mouth. Amen. And what did God say? And we will speak to that which is not 
as if it is and it will be. So there's going to be a situation where the enemy's moving in thick darkness and he's about to get the victory and it's faster than light. God translate someone there. Boom! Who's a radical believer and the light exposes everything and revival falls instead. See, translation happens quicker than the speed of light. Okay, you're awake now. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're awake now. So we've got to understand this. God spoke out of his mouth, Genesis 1-3. Let there be light, and light appeared. It did not have to wait or travel. It was there. Now it's interesting because when God said, let there be light, Genesis 1-3, he was talking about created light. Created light. Made up of photons. Let there be light. Can we agree? And suddenly a dark earth had light. Mm -hmm. We've got to understand that. When I'm talking about God's people are going to show up and the glory light of God is going to be all over them and it's going to shoot out and touch people, that's a supernatural light. Amen. How many receive that? Amen. That's a supernatural light, not bound by the laws of nature. How many receive that in the Lord? Amen. Well, what, why are you saying, Pastor, it's, it's supernatural? I should understand that. What I'm saying is it's without limitation. That's right. Amen. It's without limitation. See, we've got to realize that God's been saying things to his people, and he spoke it again yesterday. You're a people without limitation. And I'm going to use you to build a church without walls. We're about to see people walking in the realm of the Spirit that are not bound by the laws of nature. Just ask Philip. He's ministering to the Ethiopian eunuch, baptizes him, and all of a sudden, choo, he's translated to a Philistine city quicker than the speed of light. See, what we're going to realize, guys, get this. What we're going to realize is as we press in the intimacy with Jesus, we've been walked to walk as who we are called to walk at the end of the age. We will not be bound by the laws of nature as we know them. Supernatural things will begin happening. That's right. Amen. Jesus resurrects. Disciples are hanging out in the room. Doors locked. Lord doesn't care. And he's in the room. See, supernatural things are going to begin happening. Happen all over the Word of God. We got thousands of people that need to be fed. We got five loaves and two fish. Five loaves and two fish in the realm of the natural are not going to get it done. Can we agree? When, when you've got five thousand people, but when you take hmm, grab a hold of this, when you take something in the natural and you pour out upon it the supernatural, the supernatural can accomplish through the natural what never could be accomplished outside. Of that equation. Amen. So you take a natural people filled with supernatural light, and there is going to be a manifestation like we've never seen before. In the miracle of five loaves and two fishes, the supernatural manifestation was multiplication. We're about to see a, a supernatural manifestation of multiplication over the church, but we're also about to see a supernatural manifestation of illumination. Come over the church. I'm hoping this message is challenging you. I'm getting a few looks, so this is telling me it is. So this is a very good thing. How many are excited in the Lord? Amen. Okay. So, so this is what we need to understand. Go, we're talking about supernatural light here, not limited. We're created in the image of God, are we not? So we have the supernatural light of God in us. Remember the pastor I was telling you about? Went to go preach at a church, checked in the hotel. God comes to him and God says, I want to show you something. And he says, what? And he looks at his flesh and he sees like a zipper. And he unzips it a little bit and this incredible light comes out. And he's like, what is that? And the Lord says, just pull the zipper down all the way. So he pulls the zipper down all the way and he said his flesh, like a nasty suit, fell off him. And all he was was an incredible glowing light. Mm -hmm. If we could remove the veil of flesh off of you, and you're saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, you're a being of light. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what the Word says. Our God is light, is He not? And we're created in His image. 
Now let me help you understand something here. This is important. And if I can get you to get this, it's going to open up the realm of faith to you and you're going to begin moving in things in the Lord you've never moved in. How many are ready for that? Amen. Okay. Faith precedes understanding. Yes, you don't have to understand everything God's speaking today. Just receive it in faith and God will do it. Mary didn't understand how she was going to have a babe when she'd never known a man. But what she say? Let it be unto me according to thy word. Jesus said to a man who needed to be healed, let it be unto thee according to thy faith. God is raising up your faith level through teaching. Faith comes by hearing. and hearing by the word of God. Okay, let's connect those dots. This is, this is important. So if you took off your earth suit, being radically saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, what's underneath your earth suit? Light. Supernatural light or natural light? Supernatural light. Supernatural light is a higher class of light. Therefore, it has authority over natural light. So the supernatural light of God inside of you has authority over the natural light around you. It can pierce it. It can move it. It can bend it. It can displace it. It's not bound by it. Okay? So anybody ever noticed that uh, you're going down the road one day and there's a policeman that passes you? No lights on. No lights blaring. Nothing like that. Just flying down the road. And you think to yourself, oh, I was a police officer. I could do that and get away with it. That's the very truth. See, the police officer has the authority to break the law. And no one can say anything. God's put an authority in you that can break the natural laws. I'm not talking about speeding. I'm talking about thermodynamics. No, no, don't you go out there speeding and the cop pulls you over. You know, Pastor Andrew said, I've got authority over supernatural law. You'll say, okay, well, give me Pastor Andrew's number and your license, please. So, let's not get crazy with this. But is, is anybody getting what God is saying? Okay. Now let's drive this home. Let's go to Joshua 10. Would anybody... Agree with me that Joshua was a flesh and blood man. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Would anybody agree with me that he puts his pants on everybody the way everybody else did in the morning? Mm -hmm. Okay. But yet he's in a battle against the Amorites. And he knows in this battle that God wants to give Israel a great victory, so they're not gonna have to face that enemy ever again on the battlefield. I'm here to tell you today through the power of the Holy Ghost and the blood of Jesus and the love of the Father, you are about to have victory over enemies that have come and come and come and come and God's about to give you a victory where you're never going to have to see that enemy again. Amen. It's going to happen through intimacy with Jesus and radical faith. Amen. Through holiness, purity, and the fear of the Lord. So Joshua chapter 10 and verse 12, they're, they're pursuing the Amorites and Joshua understands the laws of nature. What do the laws of nature say? The sun's going to go down and when the sun goes down, it's going to get dark and we can't pursue the enemy any longer. The word does not say, and Joshua asked the Lord for something. The word does not say, and the Lord told Joshua to ask for something. Joshua is pursuing the enemy. And in verse 12, the Lord says, On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O oh, sun, stand still over Gideon. O oh, moon in the valley of Abijan. So the sun stood still, the moon stopped, and the nation avenged itself on its enemies. I want you to understand something. Joshua is pursuing the enemies of the Lord and he knows the sun's going to go down and then the battle's going to be over. He speaks to the sun and he speaks to the moon and God freezes them in orbit. Mm -hmm. They believe he had over 24 hours of daylight before then God moved the sun and God moved the moon again. This is in the word. This was old covenant. This was before the blood. 
One man. Now let me ask you a question. Let's talk about how awesome our God is. Did the sun and the moon stop only over Israel? No. No. At one man's command, the sun and the moon stopped over the whole earth. The whole earth was subject to one man's command. Elijah spoke to the, to the sky, to the clouds, and he said, there will be no more rain until I give my word. That is supernatural power. We are about to see God's people move in that kind of power where we'll be able to command the elements of the earth. Yes. Amen. Well, Pastor, I don't know if I'm real comfortable with that. Really? What did God say to Adam right after he created Adam? Take dominion over the earth. If we are supernatural light, then we have authority over natural light. If we are supernatural beings in the Lord, we have authority over the natural realm. Amen. Does that make sense to anybody in the room? That means God's people are about to move in the realm of the supernatural. Now, how many people get real excited when we realize Joshua had authority to stop the sun and the moon? Amen. Just wait till there's a healing service. Just wait till there's a healing service and a seer sees cancer in someone's body. And they take authority over that natural phenomenon of a mutating cell and command it to leave. See, the enemy understands if you begin to understand who you really are, he's finished. That's why the enemy fights messages like this when we really begin to realize who we are. 1980s. Rama Bible College. Three young men are jogging together on the track outside the school. They're in Texas. What goes on in Texas a lot? They are running, jogging, and they see a funnel cloud come up or come down and start tearing the community up around them. And they looked at it while running. They didn't even stop. In the name of Jesus, go back up! And it went and disappeared. That's a true story. So we're either going to believe that we're natural beings bound by a natural world or we're supernatural beings who through the blood of Jesus have authority over a natural world. There's a battle right now going on over what you believe. And the enemy knows if you can get into the level of supernatural faith, he's done. Because Jesus said, if you'll have faith, you can say that mountain be moved and it can be moved. I've literally heard of people just speak in the mountain, saying be moved in Jesus' name. The problem was their faith was not up to that level of the supernatural yet. See, through intimacy with Jesus, the God of the impossible wants to show you all things are possible. I don't think folks are hearing me today. I don't think folks are hearing me today. How many are hearing what the Lord is saying? Amen. Amen. The Lord is saying this to us. We're going to see miracles like Joshua saw. We're going to speak to the Son again. Yes. God says sons and daughters, I hope you're hearing this, sons and daughters of God are going to walk in His power and authority here on earth. Okay, what's going to be the sign? What's going to be the sign? Isaiah 60 verse 1. When God's people begin to arise and shine. What does arise mean? Deuteronomy 28. And you will walk as the head and not the tail. You will walk above and not beneath. What's above and not beneath? Beneath, I'm subject to natural laws. Above, I walk above those in the realm of the supernatural. Amen. I may have an earth suit that holds in my vital organs, but inside of me, I'm a supernatural being. Yes. Yes. Oh, if I can get you to get this, cancer wings are going to shut down. 
Yes. If I can get you to get this. Can I hear an amen? amen? We've got to understand that. You know what I find fascinating? A lot of near-death experiences, okay, like all of them I've ever read about pretty much, always include people when they die seeing a very bright light. Yes. Yes. You know why that is? Lost or saved. Mm -hmm. That's what they see. You know why? God is light. Yep. God is light. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, can we stay on this theme of light and science and the supernatural for just a little bit longer? Mm -hmm. Anybody enjoying this? Mm -hmm. In the natural, light is fascinating in that as light is traveling like a wave, almost like an ocean wave. So if you are out on the ocean, let's say just put off from shore a little bit and you're on a raft or an inner tube or a surfboard or, you know, whatever you may be on, you, you can just sit on the waves, right? And the waves are catchy. You know, even the waves are scientific. You, the, the, the waves just don't come in in a random sequence. If you study waves, God created the waves so they have a cycle. The tides have a cycle driven by the moon. God created the moon. Now, how are you getting this? Yeah. Okay, we, we, we've got to understand God's in charge of everything. Okay, We're not deists here. We don't believe that God created the earth and walked away. God is with us. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. So light travels in waves. So what happens if light is traveling and it runs into an object. There's an object in its path. Do you know what light does? Light will bend around it and then come back together. Okay. Do you know the older generation... When they're talking about heaven, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, right, I'll be there, okay? When they say I die, they say I'm going home. You ever heard the older generation say that? When I die, I'm going back home. I'm going back home? Okay, does anybody here have a, have a home that they live in? Apartment, condo, home, okay? Was anybody there this morning? Okay. Is anybody probably going back there this evening? Yeah. Okay. Right? And now we're in a time in between. Okay. So here's light. Runs into an object. Comes back together again. We're supernatural light, right? Yeah. Okay. In eternity past, it was us and God. What did David say? Lord, you saw my unformed body before you ever knit me together in a secret place. Okay. So God's knitting. David's body together, God's light, and he's light. Now he sends David to earth. Now David goes back home to be with God. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Hallelujah. Anybody getting this? Yep. I want you to think about that one for a second. See, your supernatural light. We are going to go back home because we've been there before. Yes, yes. exactly. See, we've got to understand something. So what is this? This is a visitation. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. We need to be awake and sober and diligent. Yeah. Amen? And we need to be careful how we live. How many are receiving this in the Lord? Yeah. Amen. Okay? That's why we've got to understand these things. Amen? We're here because, because he's here. We were with him before. We're going to be with him again. Can I hear an amen? amen? So we've got to understand that. So let me ask you a question. What's faster than light? <coughs> Light travels 186,000. No, okay, got it. We got that. Okay. Sound? That, that's a good answer. I mentioned something a moment ago that's very, very important. God's people are going to begin to translate. It's already happening. Yes, yes, yes definitely. definitely. The Lord told me not long ago, actually a couple weeks ago, working on this message, I saw people on the prayer carpet on Thursday night intercession, all on their faces before the Lord. And all of a sudden, we look up and somebody's gone. They didn't go to the restroom. And they didn't have to leave to go home. During intercession, we're not even going to see them disappear. It's going to happen so quickly. It's not like we're going to see them just color just kind of comes out of them. Gone. It's going to be like this. That fast and they're gone. And then that fast and they're back again. Translation will move quicker than light. How do you receive that in the Lord? Yeah. But it's going to be translation by what? Translation by faith. 
Okay. So let me say something to you here that's very, very important. If you're going to hear anything in this message, this is one of the top ten things you want to hear. If you're going to hear anything in this <laughs> message, are you ready for this? You are coming into agreement with who you are. The closer you move to Jesus, you're coming into agreement with who you are. The Lord is wanting to deliver you from sin consciousness and bring you into a place of God consciousness. Amen. What do I mean by that? I said, okay, guys, the Lord wants us to get our faces and repent. Are there any dirty, rotten sinners in this room saved by grace? Every room in the hand goes up. Every hand in the room goes up, right? But if I said to you, how many here in this room are supernatural beings of light not bound by the natural realm? You're powerful, you're anointed, you're fulfilling God's purpose. How many folks are like that in the room? I'd get a much slower. We have more sin consciousness than God consciousness. But the Lord says the more intimate time you spend with me, the more I'm bringing you into an understanding of who you really are. Amen. And when we come into an understanding of who we really are, we begin to realize, wait a minute, I can heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons because I walk at a higher level than they do. I walk in a higher level than death. I walk in a higher level than sickness. I walk in a higher level than pain. Is anybody getting this? Amen. See, you're coming into agreement with who you are. And the Lord says, the more time you spend with me, the more you're going to understand who you really are. And then supernatural things are going to become very natural. Because let's be honest, you're more supernatural than you are natural. Yeah. But the enemy's trying to convince you you're more natural than you are supernatural. Yeah. See, we believe the bill of goods. So how do I get to that shifting point? Peter did. Peter went from denying Christ three times to walking in such an anointing that the light of his shadow... Think about this comment. Mm -hmm. The glory light of his shadow would hit people when he walked down the road and they'd be healed. Mm -hmm. He came into agreement with who he was. Yes. Think about this now. Lord, even if every single one of them denies you, I will not, I will stand with you even in the death. Mm -hmm. And what does the Lord say to him? Peter, Peter. Why did God repeat his name twice? You watch in the Word of God, whenever, whenever God repeats somebody's name twice, there's always a shifting that's about to happen. Oh, Peter, Peter. Before the day is over, you will have denied me thrice. And you know what Peter said? Ah! Nah! No! No! Mm. See, how do you know that Jesus was already standing at the end of the timeline? He already heard the rooster crow. He already saw Peter go out. But he didn't say that to condemn him. He said, You're gonna, you are going to deny me three times and your apostleship is done. Give me the mantle. He didn't say that because he saw beyond that to the day of Pentecost. Yes. And Peter preaching arguably the greatest sermon in the history of Christianity. Yes. He saw that, through that, to Peter's shadow, healing people. He saw that to Peter now dying for the sake of Christ and saying, I'm unworthy to be crucified the way that my Lord was crucified. Mm -hmm. Crucify me and, and put the cross in the ground upside down, please. Yes. See, God always sees the finished product. You're coming into agreement with the way he already sees you. You're coming into agreement with the way he created you. You're coming into agreement with what he's spoken over you. I hope folks are getting this. Right now I think, I think I'm preaching much better than you're responding. It's either amen or oh no, right? So we've got to understand this in the Lord. How many know God's about to do things that we've never seen him do before? Amen. So I want you to think about this. The word says, our God is omniscient, omniscient and omnipresent. He knows all things and he can be everywhere at once. Does anybody agree? Yes. Okay. So to the Lord, there's no distance between here and there, past and present, present and future. 
Well, God, how when I'm an absolute mess can you give me this amazing prophetic word that you're going to use me so powerfully? Because he sees beyond the mess and he sees the finished product. Amen. Now, Josiah, all you've got to do is just come into agreement with him on that. Yes. Okay, you're omniscient, you're omnipresent, so everything you're speaking, you're already seeing, so I agree with what you're speaking. Because the very one who said, let there be light, can also tell me who I am. He has that authority. Um, is anybody getting this? Come on. I don't know, God, I think maybe you're a little off here today. I think you've been drinking the new wine up there. Because that word just seems way out there to me. Guys, trust that he's at the end of the timeline and he sees what's about to happen in your life. Trust that he sees further than what you see. Trust that when he speaks it, it comes into being. Trust. Trust. Come into agreement with the one who's the completion of all things. Mm. Rob would say, well, I just got to come to agree with God on this. And, and by the way, you don't have to understand it. Revelation is higher than knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Lord says, call upon me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things you don't know. I'm going to call upon you in faith. I'm going to receive the revelation and you're going to bring me into what I don't know. And once you bring me into the knowing, I'll know. Mm -hmm. It's Mary's, let it be unto me according to thy word. And the end times people are going to have that attitude. How many receive that in the Lord? Amen. The end times people are going to have that attitude. So grab a hold of this and Josiah, God just keeps pointing you out all message long. You know what the Lord is saying this morning? If you can get this in your spirit, it's yours. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you can get this in your spirit, it's yours. Mm -hmm. That's why you got to let it get in your spirit. Mm -hmm. Let the word of God get in your spirit. My words are spirit and they're life. Yeah. The Lord yeah. said, yeah. let the word get in your spirit. If it gets in your spirit, it's yours. And the supernatural will activate yeah. mm -hmm. in your life. Yeah. Well, Pastor, I don't know if I... If I came for this message today. <laughs> well, you know. You know, the interesting thing about... It, I'm not even going to say it. Okay, the interesting thing is, here's light. Light's flowing in waves. Bumps into something. And that's what light does, right? You know what else light does? Light reflects off of everything that it comes in contact with. And when it reflects off of what it comes in contact with, it multiplies. So when the glory light of God hits you, it reflects off of you and multiplies everywhere it goes. Oh, but you can't reflect the glory unless you get in the glory. Oh, you're not hearing me. No, you can't get in the glory. You can't reflect the glory unless you get in the glory. Come on, you can't reflect the glory unless you get the glory. we got to understand this. The Lord's calling you to a whole lot of things you just haven't gotten into yet. The Lord says, step in. Deep is calling unto deep. Step into these deeper realms. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. I hope you're now getting into this word. 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. Oh, hallelujah. God says it's time to step in. The Lord says it's time to step in. The Lord says step into my glory. You can reflect my glory. Hey! How many are getting this in the Lord? First thing, I we're going to get a little charismatic here on uh, ooh, Pentecost Sunday. Ooh, hallelujah. In fact, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.4. The word says this. But you, brothers, there's no but. But you, brothers, are not in darkness. So that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are sons of the what? Isn't that interesting? You are sons of the light and sons of the day. You do not belong to the night or to the darkness. Hmm. Wow. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. 
For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go. Oh, i got to read the next verse. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. What does that word say? Whether you're awake or you're asleep, God wants to bring you to a place of habitation with him continually. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Mm. Where's Rob? Well, we got to see this for what it is. Amen. Hallelujah. This is important. So the word of God says, identity moment, identity moment, we are sons of the light. He is the light or his sons. As we are, let us create man. Who are you in your innermost being? Your light. That's why after you get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, if you try to go back to the darkness, it's just never the same. Because you're no longer a part of it. And you can't enjoy it anyway. And it wasn't enjoyable in the first place. So let's stop smelling the wine cork and let's begin to be the people God created us to be. Amen. Hallelujah. My, my, parents, my parents didn't get saved until they were in their mid-30s. My mom was carrying me and uh, traveling down a country road, gets sick. Pulls over, up checks, gets back in the vehicle, looks up, and she's in front of a Baptist church with a lit revival sign. I think that was prophetic. Yeah. And so my parents go and they get saved and they surrender to the ministry. And I was young, 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 probably five years old. And we go to Lino's one night for dinner. And uh, we're sitting there and they order and give their menus back to the waitress. And we're sipping on water, eating bread, talking. And my mom looks over, and the previous folks that had sat at that table had gotten a bottle of wine. So, you know, my folks lived in the world prior to being saved. So my, want, my, my mom grabs the wine cork, and she sniffs it. I remember seeing this as a kid, didn't get it. Hands it to my dad, and he sniffs it. And my mom says to my dad, oh, do you remember when? And my dad looks at her and goes, Sherry, it really wasn't that great back then either. <laughs> so stop sniffing the wine cork. <laughs> and let's become the people that God created us to be. Can I hear an amen? amen? So the word says that we're sons of the day. We're sons of the light. We're not part of the darkness. Can I hear an amen? amen. Okay. Now let's get real interesting with this. So when I talk about light in this message, I'm not talking about natural light. But everything in the natural is a pale reflection of the supernatural. Can we agree with that? Amen. Okay. So in the natural, if we had a prism and we shined natural white light into that prism, that prism would separate the light and you'd see all the colors that make up white light. Amen. White light in the natural is made up of seven colors. Seven colors. Isn't that interesting? The darker the color, interestingly enough, the more intense the light. Now, if light in the natural... If I can take light in the natural and put it through a prism and seven colors emerge, the seven colors that make up white light, seven in the Hebrew is the number of completion. Seven colors completes what light is in the realm of the natural. Can we agree? So what do you get then when you take supernatural light and you put it through a supernatural prism? If natural light gives us seven colors... You take supernatural light and you put it through a supernatural prism and you know what you get? The sevenfold spirit of God. Amen. The spirit of the Lord and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. The spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation. The spirit of counsel the spirit of might and the spirit of knowledge. Meaning what? When you have the supernatural light of God in you, you have the sevenfold spirit of God in your life. Amen. All seven folds are yours. Is anybody going, oh, that's kind of cool. I feel the Spirit of God moving on that one. So that means the sevenfold Spirit of God is in you. So if you have the light of God in you, you have access to the sevenfold Spirit of God. Let me tell you how powerful this is. Okay, We do bracing, not welding, where I work. 
Okay, we've got a former bracer that's in the room right now. Somebody who works there that I love in the Lord. Hallelujah. But I was reading a story about a radically saved, spirit-filled welder. So he was welding two pieces of metal together. How many know when you're melting weld when you are welding metal together, it gets very hot. So two pieces of metal, torch, and a bucket full of water to cool the metal is what he's got. He is welding those two pieces of metal together. He overwelds and actually, unfortunately, then uh, affects the integrity of the bead of weld that he's laying. And so one of the pieces of metal falls. What do you do instinctively when something falls? Grab it. It's red hot. His hands are bare. True story. So it goes to fall. He grabs it super supernaturally his spirit begins to move and before he realizes what's happening as he grabs that red hot piece of metal he hears himself say spirit of might and he grabs it lifts it down into the water lets it go pulls up his hand and it's not even touched that's the spirit of might God's people are going to get to the place where their spirit begins to override their body. Because we're truly going to be walking in the spirit, not in the flesh. Is anybody going, this is kind of cool stuff? Oh, you know what's even cooler? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Seeds of the supernatural being planted in you right now that are going to come forth in very unique moments of your life. That's the power of the teaching anointing. How many receive that in the Lord? See, you're being taught into things that you're coming into. How many receive that in the Lord? Okay. So what does this mean? When Jesus healed people, what did he do a lot of times when he healed them? He would touch them, right? He would touch the blind. He would touch the lame. The Word of God says one of the passage, and he touched them and he healed them. What are you touching with? Your hands. So with his hands, there was a release of. Okay. Second Timothy. Timothy, I want to remind you to stir up the anointing that was given to you by the laying on of hands. hands. Your hands are very important supernaturally. What are you trying to say? That's why the word says, do not be hasty with the laying on of hands mm -hmm. because hands release power. Yes. That's why you don't want to be just hasty laying hands on anybody, nor do you want to let, let folks be hasty laying hands on you. There is a transfer of anointing with the laying on of hands, whether positive or negative. Mm -hmm. yes. okay. As this church grows and the supernatural begins to happen, that new person shows up and says, hey, can I lay hands on you and pray for you? That's where you got to say, I don't want you to be offended, but I need to know the fruit on the tree first. Because mm -hmm. the enemy will send people from the occult into the church yeah. when the supernatural starts happening. Mm -hmm. Because even in the realm of the natural, in the darkest of night, when you turn on the porch light, what is drawn to it? When the supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit starts happening in a church, things are drawn. We need to understand that principle. Some in this room understand it better than others. But we need to understand that. Okay? See, we need to understand that. But the supernatural is going to become natural to you. So, there's a release of anointing with the laying on of hands. You can release the glory and the light of God through your hands. How many receive that? Amen. There's a time coming when the people of God will just put a hand out and the light will come forth from their hands. Amen. Fifteen years ago when this church first started, we had a worship leader who... Um, was still coming into the things of the Lord the way he needed to. and But he and the group that he was with would go and minister in bars. 
and they were going to go to a bar one night and minister, and they called me up, hey, Pastor, can you come and pray for us? So it was dark out. I said, okay, guys, just close your eyes, and the Lord will start praying for them, laying my hands on each of their heads and praying that God will bless their, the ministry they're going to do in this bar. Amazing guys, characters. And as I'm praying for them, when I wrap up, one of them looks at me and said, when you prayed for me, my eyes were closed, but I saw lightning going from your hands and touching everybody in the group. That's why the word talks about laying on of hands. This is very supernatural. That's why you need to be careful where your hands go. Because God is going to use these as holy hands. The word talks about men lifting up holy hands to the Lord. The time is going to come where we're going to be in a service and somebody's going to get up and come over to me and say, Pastor, I've got a word that God wants me to release and the Holy Spirit's going to say, Andrew, you, you let them release it. And they're going to get up and say, the Lord spoke and the light of God is going to come forth from their hand. I've known people that have a healing anointing that when God wants to start healing people, their hands would get hot and, and almost glow red. That's why we need to be very careful what our hands are touching at the end of the age. Because we don't want them touching wrong things at all. And then being used for the ministry of God. That's a whole other message, but is anybody hearing that word without me going real deep in it? Amen. 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 Here's something interesting also. The majority of the light that you'll ever see in the realm of the natural comes from heat. It comes from heat. The sun emits light. Right? If I took a piece of iron and I heated it with a torch, it would begin to glow. In fact, if I continued, if continued to heat it, you'd see multiple colors come out of it in time. You'd see yellows and oranges and reds. If I heated it up enough, you would see blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hottest light is blue. Yeah. So when I take natural light, put it through a prism, I get seven colors. The hottest color is blue, mm -hmm. interestingly enough. Do you know what blue represents in the Hebrew? Heaven. Purple's right. Sometimes they're interchangeable. Isn't that interesting? So isn't it interesting in a natural realm when you heat something up the hottest it can be or a flame is the hottest it can be, it's blue? And blue in the Hebrew is a picture of heaven. Is that interesting to anybody in the room? Is anybody going, that's kind of cool? Yeah. So we, we've got to understand this. And you know what the Lord says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29? I'm an all-consuming fire. Do you know what that means? At the end of the age, God's people are going to be so close to the all-consuming fire that they're going to glow the blue light of heaven. Mm. Mm. Now it's interesting if I take Hebrews 12, 29 and I take it into the New Living Translation, the Word of God says our God is a devouring fire. What does the devouring God of fire consume? Anything that's not holy and anything that's not light is what it's going to consume. Guys, I'm telling you, you're going to walk into darkness and the glory light of God is going to begin to radiate through you. Why? Because when God walked in the darkness in Genesis 1, he said, let there be light. Mm -hmm. And the light is just going to manifest through you. You're not, you're not going to think, boy, this room, this room needs some light. I think I need to release some supernatural light. You're just going to walk and God's going to activate that light through you. Mm -hmm. Amen. I think we're here in the Lord today. What do you think? Yeah, I think we're here in the Lord. And you know what the Lord spoke to me about this? He said, the more time you spend in the all-consuming fire, the more you're going to conform to it. You're going to become like what you behold. So the Lord says, get into the all-consuming fire and you're going to become a fire for me. Isn't that interesting? Amen. You know another interesting thing about light and science? A number of years back, they discovered something called DNA. 
And everybody in the room has a unique DNA structure. And they found that not only was there something called DNA, they found a unique way that DNA manifests in the body. Do you know how it manifests? Helix structure. Like this is the way DNA looks in the body. It's like this. Do you know the way that light travels? The same exact way. In the helix pattern of photons. You know why? Because God is light and he is life. And when he spoke light and he released life, it released in the very structure of God. The helix pattern. Isn't that interesting? Amen. That's the way God created us. How many receive this in the Lord? Do you know what blood is? You know what they're finding blood is? Congealed light. You know why? What did the Lord say all the way back in the Old Covenant? The life is in the blood. He is the life and he is the light. Why wouldn't the life be concealed, congealed light? Is anybody going, this is kind of fascinating? Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is who we are. Can I hear an amen? amen? Then why would God say don't eat an animal's blood? Because he wants to be the life that's within you. Yes. He, doesn't any, he doesn't want any other light or life source coming forth from you. How many receive that? Amen. We've got to understand that. And the Lord is saying to us today, we can go from fresh flesh and blood to light by being conformed to his image. I'm telling you guys, intercessors are about to go from the prayer carpet to the nations. Mm -hmm. We're about to see this happen in the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wrap up with this. How many love the Psalms? Amen. Amen. I love David. You know, David said in Psalm 16, 8 in the King James Version, he says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Isn't it interesting? He says this in the Old Covenant. He says, I've set the Lord always before me. How do you set the Lord always before you? <clears throat> David got a revelation no matter where he was, God was there with him. Yeah. I set the Lord always before me. Whether he was worshiping at the temple, making a decision from the throne, out on the battlefield, he said, I've set the Lord always before me. Which means what? Wherever you are, the Lord wants to release his light through you because he's there. What does the word say? At the end of the 400 years of darkness of Malachi, the word says a people living in darkness have seen a great light. And I tell you what, as you spend time in the middle of the all-consuming fire, you're going to be conformed into his image and you're going to become light and life. Mm -hmm. And then wherever you go, God's going to release it. I don't know about that, Pastor. Well, remember Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They wouldn't bow down to the idol, so they get thrown in a fiery furnace. In the fiery furnace, who do they meet? They meet Jesus. They meet one that looks like the son of the gods, the word said. Anybody ever read that before? Why would they meet Jesus in the fire? Because he is the all-consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29, we've got to understand that. And the closer we get to the fire, the more we become like it. God is saying to my people, step into my fire. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? I, I'm telling you. And the Holy Spirit is saying something very simple to us today. The Lord is saying, if you want me to take you deeper in the realm of the Spirit, all you need to do is ask. Come into agreement with my word and become what it says. Grab a hold of this. The Lord says, come into agreement with my word and you will become what it says. Come into agreement with my word and you will become what it says. Amen. That's why Jesus said, 
In John chapter 15, the abiding chapter, if you abide in my word, my word will abide in you, and you'll ask the Father whatsoever you will in my name, and he'll give it to you. What was Jesus saying? Come into agreement with my word, and you will become my word manifest in the earth. Amen. Grab a hold of this. Jesus came into agreement with the Father regarding what the Father wanted him to do. And Jesus became the Word made flesh. Okay, I don't think you caught that. When Jesus surrendered to the will of the Father to come to be the Lamb of God and die to take away the sins of the world and rise again, when Jesus came into agreement with the will of the Father, he became the Word made flesh. When you come into agreement with the Word of God, you become the Word. So what's the, what's the challenge in the church today? We're not coming into agreement with the Word of God. How do we not come into agreement with the Word of God? I don't like what that passage says. So I'm just going to ignore it like it's not there. Hmm. Kind of like when you're a kid and all of a sudden you realize there's a Rottweiler in your close proximity. And you think, I'm just going to close my eyes and do this and it's going to go away. <laughs> um, I'm sorry guys, Romans 1 is not just going to go away. And some of you know where I'm going with this. I'm sorry, what the Word of God says is not just going to go away because the Lord said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will endure forever. So the church has got to stop going, well, I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I don't like the charismata, and I don't like tongues, and I don't like this, and I don't believe that's for today, and I don't believe a loving God would send anyone to hell, and I don't believe this, and I don't believe that. A church that will not come into agreement with the Word of God will not become the Word. Amen. So what we need to, be, to do is be like Jesus. We need to come into agreement with him and become everything he's called us to be. Yeah. It will not happen until we come into agreement with the word. It will not happen until we come into agreement with the Spirit. Amen. Does anybody receive that? Amen. And by the way, there's nothing that determines whether or not you come into agreement or not, but you. It's not determined by the demons. It's not determined by your parents. It's not determined by your spouse. It's not determined by your circumstance. It's determined by you. We got to come into agreement with the Word of God and become the Word made flesh. Amen. The light and the salt in the midst of a lost and dying world. Mm -hmm. We will become like what we behold. How many receive that in the Amen. Amen. Amen? If you receive that in the Lord, just say amen. amen. Let the people of God say so. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to give you a warning. <laughs> if you receive this word today, you're about to have supernatural things begin to happen in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you guys, I saw the supernatural yesterday. I saw almost an entire church one by one go down in the realm of the Spirit, some on their faces in the grass in the park yesterday. Holy Spirit was boom, 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 just taking people out, moving, giving prophetic words that were so right on, people were crying and weeping. Holy Spirit was doing that. Amen. The Word was being made flesh yesterday. A group of us saw it. A group of us saw it. All it takes is one person being willing to come into alignment with the Word of God and believe that who they are, who God says they are. Yes. It's all it takes. It's all it takes. Twelve men did it and they turned the world upside down. That's all it takes. He says you will know the Word of God and you'll know the God of the Word. As that begins to happen, look out because the sun's going to start standing still again. Amen. Do you receive it? Amen. Amen. Alright. Let's close our eyes this morning in a non-religious way.
Hallelujah. I'm going to ask Brother Art to turn the lights out for us. How do you receive this word today? Amen. The Lord said this is a teaching that's going to open up doors. The Lord says this is a teaching that's going to break down walls. The Lord says this is a teaching that's going to build faith. So right now, I want to encourage you, just put your hands up before the Lord on this Pentecost Sunday. And if you desire the things that God was speaking in the Word today, just say, Lord, I want everything that you just spoke. Lord, I want everything that you just released. Let it be unto me according to thy Word. May your Word abide in me. As I abide in your word, then may I become everything you said I would be through the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. So be careful. You just came into agreement with everything God was speaking, which means you're going to begin to see the supernatural happen. The Lord says, what's going to happen as we come into agreement with this word today, us and everybody that's listening on, in online, the Lord says, what is going to happen is that we're going to begin to see atmosphere shift. We're going to begin to see people healed. We're going to begin to see miracles happen. The Lord said, we're going to walk into a room and we're going to see what Jesus is doing. And then we're going to do it. The Lord says, this is what's coming. Josiah, do you receive it? Geo, do you receive it? Sam, do you receive it? Olivia, you receive it? Yeah. We're going to become everything God said we're going to be. You are coming into agreement with the one who is the completion of all things. I declare that over you right now in Jesus' name. So just lift your hands up to receive. And Lord Jesus, I ask that you pour your glory light out over this room right now. Lord, I ask that you would pour your glory light out over everybody that's listening in. Lord, on radio and the broadcast, Lord, online. Lord, I ask God that you'd anoint these hands with the glory light anointing. Lord, may you use these hands that are lifted up to you as your vessels. These are your hands, Lord Jesus, use them. Lord, use these hands to heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons. Lord, use these hands to release your light in your life. Lord, release the, use these hands to release your glory and your power. Lord, use these hands hands to do greater things than what you did. Lord, I ask right now, God, that the veil would become very thin that holds the light inside of us. Lord, may the veil of the flesh become very thin. And Lord, I pray, may your people begin to illuminate. Lord, I thank you that Moses was in the presence of the all-consuming fire on top of the mountain. And Lord, when he came down, his face glowed to the point where they asked him to mask it. Because God, they couldn't take the glory light. And Lord, that was your glory light going from the outside in. Lord, I thank you for us in the new covenant. The glory light is inside of us and will come out. And Lord, I thank you that's a glory that won't fade away. So, Lord, I ask right now, may you release some glory in this house. May you release the Shekinah over your people. And, Lord, may your glory light begin to shine. Lord, you sit arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord shines round about you. Lord, I decree and declare from this day forward, the glory light of God is going to shine over this people. And I declare it in the name of the Amen, the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I declare also God's opening up your spirit for dreams and visions. I declare God's opening you up for angelic visitation. And I declare because heaven is your home, you're going to have third heaven encounters. Just like John on the Isle of Patmos, you're going to hear the Lord say, Come up here! And I declare you're going to be caught up into the third heaven. In Jesus' name. I declare as Taylor leads worship again, as God opens up that door in this house, as she leads harp and bowl, as God opens up that door, I declare the glory of the Lord is going to come through her hands, onto those strings, and through her voice. And I declare songs that have been sung in the third heaven that have never been heard on earth 
are going to come forth from her. Hey! In the name of Jesus. And I declare the supernatural is about to come through you. In Jesus' name. Now I declare over you, let it be unto you according to the Lord's word. Do you receive that? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just say, Lord, I receive your word. May I become your word. Your way. Your alignment. Your blueprint. Your timing. Make me your light. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, I think as this word begins to manifest, you're going to be amazed. So let's now celebrate the word that God released today in communion. Amen. We're going to commune with him this morning. So let me say again what I said a few moments ago. You don't have to be a part of this church to take communion with us. Just part of the family of God. And anybody at home that wants to take communion with us, I encourage you to, to grab some grape juice and, and bread and, and just take communion with us. How many know we want to do everything, every time, every way, according to the Word of God? Amen? And the Word of God says that we shouldn't just open up the communion table, say, come on up and get your communion items. The Lord said we should always take a moment and prepare our hearts for communion. Well, Pastor, how do I prepare my heart for communion? I do it by confessing anything that I've walked in that's grieved the heart of God. That I repent for anything that I've been involved in that grieves the Holy Spirit. From the last time I took communion, or even beyond that if you need to, if there's anything in your life that you know you need to confess before the Lord, I want to encourage you to do it. But pastor, there's no gross sin in my life. There's, there's no things going on that are horrible. Yeah, but how about resisting the Spirit of God? How about wanting your own way? How about going left when the Holy Spirit says go right? How about stubbornness? Right? There's a lot of things that we do that may not be gross sin, but they grieve the Spirit of God. So I want to encourage you. Prepare your heart for communion. Let's just take a few moments in the stillness of the presence of And I just speak the Spirit of God is moving over hearts right now. The Spirit of God is moving over hearts right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you said, if I confess my sin, you're faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And Lord, I decree and declare as sin is being confessed in this room, there's a cleansing that's coming. There's a redemption that's covering and coming. Lord, I thank you that redeem means to buy back, to possess once again what once was. And Lord, I decree and declare you're redeeming. And I decree and declare, Lord God, you're restoring. And I decree and declare you're healing. Lord, I speak a release of shalom and shalom over your people right now. And Lord, I pray as we get ready to take communion, Lord, I plead your blood over the bread. Lord, I thank you that healing is the children's bread. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that you'll release healing over everyone that partakes of the bread, whether in the sanctuary or watching. Lord Jesus, I ask that everyone that partakes of the cup will receive deliverance and healing and cleansing today, Lord. Lord, I declare in you everything's changing. Everything's changing. Everything's changing. Lord, go before us. 
and move the things in the timeline that need to be there for what we're coming into. And Lord Jesus, right now in your name, we repent not only for our sin, but like Nehemiah, we repent for the sin of our generation, Lord. Lord, we repent for abortion. Lord, we repent for pride. Lord, we repent for a nation divided. Lord, we repent for self-sufficiency and self-righteousness in your church. But Lord, I thank you where sin abounds, the grace of God even more abounds. Lord, we ask for great grace. In Jesus' name, we ask for great grace. And Lord, we pray this in your precious name. Thank you, Lord, for your body that was broken and for your blood that was shed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand up this morning. Hallelujah. I'm going to call you up to the table in just a moment. As I call you up to the table, I'm going to encourage you to take a piece of bread and a cup and take it back to your seat. Hold on to it because we will then partake together. Amen. So I'm going to ask for these two groups to come to the middle and then come down to the communion table to get your communion items. Oh, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Oh, Oh, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. <coughs> the blood of Jesus. Let's have these two groups come together and come up and around, please. The blood of Jesus. Oh, new realms. New realms. Feel it.
<laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, Jesus, my sister. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, the fun. <laughs> Lord is just so sweet, so tangible. Lord is here. Just take a moment with the cup and the bread in your hands. And in your own way, just thank the Lord. Thank you. God is just pouring the river out again, is he not? <laughs> Glory. <laughs> Glory. Yes. Oh, glory. If I go out, Scott, you got communion, brother. That's <laughs> <laughs> Corinthians. <laughs> saying, I'm returning this house 
back to her first love. I'm returning this house to intimacy. Mm. The Lord said to me not long ago, I'm going to return this house back to things it once did. And as it does them, I'm going to bring this house into things it's never done before. Lord Jesus, we come into agreement with you. Therefore, may we become like you. are still here. That's right. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I forgot that for a second. Thank you, Lord. Whew. Okay. You're all we want, Lord. Just hold up bread before the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I thank you, I thank you. for your beautiful body your beautiful God, eh? that was broken, was broken for, my sake. for my sake. This day, this day I, come into agreement I come into agreement with everything your broken body, your broken body purchased, purchased for me, for my family, for Israel, and for my generation. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Cheers to the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed. He took the bread. And he said, this bread represents my body, which will be broken for your sake. The word says he broke it that night. He did something that was unheard of at Passover. He took the bread and the cup of Passover and he related them to who he was. And he said, I'm the bread. And he said, I'm the cup. So as we partake of the bread, we partake of Jesus. You know, our Catholic brothers and sisters believe that the bread literally becomes the body and the cup literally becomes the blood. God bless them. How many know he is the bread and he is the cup? Yeah. He said, this do in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread. <laughs> yes, Lord. No matter what comes, we can't quit. Because we're partaking of the very things that he gave for our sake. He gave his body and he shed his blood. There's nothing left that he could give. He gave it all. The Lord is calling a generation to give it all for his sake. in your heart, guys. But no matter what, we're not going to turn back. Like that old song we used to sing in children's church, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. No turning back. Let's hold the cup up before the Lord. Yes, Lord. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. 
I thank you, I thank you. For, your for your precious blood that was shed, that was shed. For, my sake. for my sake. I come into agreement, come into agreement. this day, this day. With, everything with everything your precious blood, your precious blood. Purchased, purchased for me, for my family, for Israel, and for my generation. May I become like the God I behold, you, Lord Jesus. There is something very sacred about this communion today. Wow. Church, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the cup and he said, this cup represents my blood that will be shed for your sake. The very one who said that and said prior, the life is in the blood. So Lord Jesus, I declare as we partake of the cup or partaking of your blood, Lord, the redemptive blood of Jesus. Lord, it may taste like grape juice, but God, it's symbolic the most beautiful act that the world has ever known. That the universe could ever perceive something that the angels long to look into. A song that they can't sing, right guys? Right. <laughs> oh, and one of the authors of the Gospels went on to say that Jesus also said that night, I will not partake of the fruit of the vine again until we're all together. Bo Yeshua Bo. Say that with me. Bo Yeshua Bo. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Ile Mato. Ile Mato. Santos. He said, This do in remembrance of me. Let us partake. Thank you, John.